deformities, extra legs, missing joints, or crippled appendages. These are all naturally occurring features of biology that can be caused by a plethora of things ranging from birth defects, inbreeding issues, and environmental contaminants. However, if you're a frog, all these other variables are a minor concern to you compared to the parasite Riberio ondatre, a parasite that's known to cause deformities in amphibians often resulting in missing or extra legs. But if you're a frog, how is this parasite forcing you to grow extra legs? And more importantly, why would a parasite do that in the first place? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today in this video. But before we start talking about how this parasite can cause Teenage Mutant Ninja Frogs, please make sure to like this video and subscribe as it really helps grow the channel. Now, before I can start to explain how and why this parasite does this to frogs, I need to describe its biology just a bit, so bear with me. As I have established, Riberio onditri is a parasite that infects frogs. However, frogs represent more of an in-between step for this parasite. You see, this parasite is a flatworm parasite from the class of Trematoda, also commonly called the flukes. Now, there are thousands of fluke parasites around the world, each specializing in infecting different types of animals, and all of these parasite trematodes tend to be highly specific, only infecting a few different species. However, one thing that is maintained between all trematodes is the presence of a complex life cycle. And what I mean by this is that to reproduce, these parasites need to infect at least two different hosts, oftentimes requiring three different hosts, and the final host is what we would call a definitive host. Going back to our frog friends, these little guys are what we would call a second intermediate host in the life cycle after a snail. But unfortunate for the frogs, the parasite doesn't sexually reproduce here, but instead it mates inside the gut of a bird or mammal, meaning the parasite wants this frog to be eaten at some point. Fire in the food chain! Get in my belly! Come on. Now, once the frog is eaten, the parasite will start to set up shop in the bird's gut, and it will start to release eggs that it will be passed in the feces. Once in the water, these eggs will hatch and they release a stage that goes on to find a snail. Once it finds a snail, the parasite will then infect said snail and then it will actually castrate the snail. Now, in the place that the gonads of the snail used to exist, the trematodes will go through a few different stages, but this will ultimately result in asexual reproduction. Gary! Uh, I was just looking for the sports channel, Gary. And what they're doing is they're making thousands and thousands of free living stages called cercaria. This term, cercaria, may or may not be familiar with you as it's also the thing that causes swimmer's itch, a common skin irritation that is from a different species of parasite that often is encountered when people are swimming in lakes and rivers and things like that. However, this parasite doesn't actually infect people, it just causes some skin irritation, and I can talk about that in a future video if people are interested. But now back to our frog parasite. After asexually reproducing in the snail, these cercaria are released into the water in the thousands, and what they're doing is they're swimming around looking for a tadpole to infect, and as such, they will swim until they either bump into a tadpole or they die. Now, there are a lot of factors that dictate the success of these stages, and they're often not that successful, hence why so many have to be released by the snail. However, once a parasite does find a tadpole, it will penetrate the skin and it will make its way to its limb bud of the tadpole. Now the limb bud of a tadpole is the region where the frog will develop its legs, and this is where the parasite actually chooses to insist and where it will wait for a hungry bird to come around so it can restart this life cycle all over again. So that's the general life cycle of this parasite, and frankly I skated over a lot of the details and nuances of the life cycle to kind of make it a little bit more streamlined so people don't get bored, but now we can start to answer the question, why is this parasite causing deformities in frogs? Well, if you're anything like me, you spend a lot of your childhood in rivers trying to catch frogs, and if you've ever done this, you know that they're pretty hard to get a hold of, as they're pretty fast, they jump pretty far, and they're a lot faster than a five-year-old Chris. For me, this was part of the fun. But for a hungry bird, a slightly slower frog that can't jump or swim very well is actually their version of Uber Eats. So this is the reason why the parasite infects tadpole limb buds. By forming a cyst in these buds, the parasite disrupts normal development, resulting in extra legs, no legs, or deformed legs, with the chance of deformity increasing with the number of parasites that infect the frog. In fact, one study found that infected and deformed frogs swam 37% slower and had 66% less endurance which is a pretty huge deal when you're trying to escape a predator. Now, for a long time, it was believed that these deformities were primarily a result of the cyst physically disrupting the limb buds. However, recent studies show that the parasite are actually more nefarious than that. See, recent studies show that encysted worms have 70% less retinoic acid, which is a derivative of vitamin A, than cercaria, which is believed to be a sign that they are actually secreting this retinoic acid into the frog during its development. And Retinoic acid is a crucial signaling molecule during vertebrate development. 
and as a result is believed to be causing these deformities, which lends credence to the theory that these parasites are purposefully inducing these deformities to help aid in getting back to their next host, i.e. being eaten by a bird. Now, in the parasite's goal to be eaten by a bird, these deformities seem to be quite successful, as in a large study that surveyed over 100 locations and more than 12,000 amphibians, researchers described infections in adult amphibians to be extremely rare, suggesting that there is a survival bias in that non-infected amphibians were just more likely to be found as adults because the infected ones had already been consumed. However, it's always important to keep a critical eye. Now, parasites aren't the only feature that can cause deformities in these frogs. So in a massive study done by a team led by Dr. Peter Johnson out of Boulder, Colorado, they monitored for other factors such as pesticides, heavy metals, pH level, and nitrates, and found that basal deformity rates were always below 5% prevalence, i.e. less than 5% of the frogs ever had these types of deformities. However, in systems where this parasite was observed to be present, deformity rates were significantly higher than the basal rate, with some locations even experiencing rates of greater than 50 to 90% of frogs having some kind of deformity, which is pretty insane when you think about it. Now, obviously, there's some high variation in this data, and some of you may be asking, why are some systems so much more heavily impacted by this parasite? Well, there are two main factors controlling this parasite. First is the presence of the snail intermediate host, specifically snails from the genus Planorbella, or commonly called ram's horn snails, due to their close resemblance of a ram's horn. Now, because this parasite needs to infect ram's horn snails in rivers, lakes, and ponds where there are no ram's horn snails present, or very few snails present, you won't find this parasite, and as a result, there'll be very few deformed frogs in the area. However, a secondary factor that the researchers observed to be quite important for limiting the infection when there were these snails present in the system was the biodiversity of the system, in that the more animals, the more wildlife present in the system, the more diverse, the less likely frogs were to be infected. Now, this observation of diversity limiting infection is a common theory in parasitology known as the dilution hypothesis which proposes that increased biodiversity in an ecological community can reduce the prevalence of infectious disease by diluting the risk of pathogen transmission as different species have varying susceptibilities to infection. What this means in more common speech is that because parasites only have a few species they can typically infect, the more species that are present in an area, the less likely they are to encounter the ones they can infect. Thinking back to those cercaria that we were talking about before that are released in the thousands, if there's a bunch of different species that they can't actually infect, and only a few frogs, they're less likely to encounter these frogs than an area that's only frogs. Now we actually have a really good example of this actually occurring in a study. So a paper from 2007 in which researchers found aquatic insect larvae such as dragonflies and damselflies would readily consume dozen of the parasite's cercaria. So by just having a few of these predatory insects in the water with the frogs, they can actually help protect the frogs by predating upon the cercaria. And now these are just a minor example, but imagine a system with a lot of fish and other things that could bump into the parasite and just reduce its chances of getting to a frog. Now the data from this 2007 paper falls directly into the observations made by Peter Johnson's team in which they found the highest infection rates were observed in artificial impoundments, but in more wild and natural settings, there was much lower infection rates, likely due to the increased diversity of these systems. This parasite is unlikely to drive a healthy species to extinction. However, this parasite does appear to be increasing in frequency, likely due to human influence, and this could be problematic for some species that are considered endangered or vulnerable. For example, the California tiger salamander, which is a vulnerable species, are susceptible to this parasite, and wild infections have been observed to be occurring, which could further damage its population. Outside of this one example, many amphibian species are actually already in somewhat dire condition due to an outbreak of chytrid fungus, which is a type of fungus that grows on the skin of amphibians and suffocates them as amphibians breathe through their skin partially. Now, the introduction of chytrid fungus has resulted in severe population declines and even extinction of some species in North America. So as a result, the increasing frequency of this parasite could be problematic for some of these populations that have already been devastated by the chytrid fungus. Fortunately, there is actually something being done about this. There is an organization known as the Amphibian Arc, which is a conservation effort trying to preserve amphibian populations that have been impacted by the chytrid fungus, and they're trying to save these before they go extinct. If you're interested in learning more about chytrid fungus, its history, and its biology, there's a lot of information on the Amphibian Arc's webpage, and I've added a link into the description if you want to read more about them or donate to their cause because it is a pretty awesome cause trying to preserve some of our biodiversity. 
Similar to all the other parasites I've covered on this channel so far, this parasite, although devastating to some wildlife species, is completely harmless to people, and there are no reports of it impacting any domestic animals. In fact, if you're a French chef, this parasite might even be of great use to you. But all kidding aside, I think this parasite just really illustrates another cool aspect of parasite biology, and how these worms, these small, minuscule worms, can really drastically alter the ecology of a system, and the ecology of a host in particular, and in some areas be pretty profound on some of the populations. Now, to those of you that are still watching, thank you for watching the whole video, I hope you enjoyed it and learned something. If you want me to talk about some other topics, such as that swimmer's itch example I mentioned earlier in the video, or even RFK's brain worm, please let me know in the comments as I'm always open to suggestions for my future videos. Thank you and have a nice day.